Greetings and welcome in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to St. Andrew's Worship Niagara-on-the-Lake. If you're joining us for the first time, a very warm welcome. Please take a look at the description below the video and you'll find some information about how to get to know us better through Facebook and through our website. And so now, my friends, let's prepare ourselves to give God the glory and to give him all of our attention. Let's take a moment to just quiet all the distractions in our minds. Oh God, your love for us is warm and brooding, which has brought us to birth and opened our eyes to the wonder and beauty of creation. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things. To him who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might. For it is Jesus who has said to us, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Jesus Christ is that light, and this candle is lit as a symbol that the darkness has been overcome. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please join me in the call to worship, which you'll find on your screen. Gladden the souls of your servants, O God. To you, O Lord, we lift up our hearts. The Lord is good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love. Listen to our cries, O God, and answer. God is great and does wondrous things, so we come to worship and bow down before you, O Lord. Let's glorify God's name together. And now let's sing to God's glory, holy, holy, holy.
Let's approach God together in prayer. Let's pray together. God of grace, you created our minds to grow in wisdom. You created our hearts to expand with love for you and your world. You created our voices to sing your praises forever. Fill us to overflowing with your Holy Spirit so we may worship you in spirit and in truth. Bold and unafraid to follow you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. God who creates the future, you call us to follow you, yet we confess we prefer to remain where we are. You offer us new beginnings, yet we continue to make the same familiar choices. You invite us into the fullness of life, yet we distance ourselves from you and each other through fear and doubt. Forgive us, O oh God, cleanse us from every unworthy thought, word, and deed with the grace of Christ our Lord. Rouse us by the Spirit to be intentional, courageous disciples, even when the world does not welcome us, or the word we proclaim in Jesus' name. For it is in his name that we pray together the prayer that he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. My friends, the good news today and always is that in Christ we are all made as new creations. The old life is gone and the new life comes. Know, my friends, that God loves you and forgives you. And do not be afraid to take that first step into that new step that he offers you. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now I'm going to turn it over to Marie, Carla, and Mark as they minister to us through the children's story. Hello. Hi. Um, well, my question for today, have you ever felt thirsty? Yes, a lot. A lot. For how long, Mark, you waited when you were thirsty? For how long you waited to drink? Maybe three hours because there was no water. So you had to wait three whole hours. Carla, you had to wait for so long sometimes? Well, sometimes it's like all I need to do is just go the, go like if I'm upstairs, I have to go downstairs. Um, to drink? Then, yeah, and then I take the filter and pour it into oh, okay. the cup and drink. But... Um, have you waited for so long to drink at some point? Um, yeah, once. Once? You were maybe? Three. You were three years old when you had to wait. Yeah. Okay, so Mark, you remember the last time you had to wait for three hours to drink? And how did you feel when you finally got to drink? I was happy, thankful. <laughs> Happy and thankful, yeah, and you felt such a relief, yeah, maybe? Mm -hmm. Oh, Carla. Maybe, maybe. Carla, have you ever felt thirsty to God? Yes, sometimes um, I have, like, things, like, that I feel like I'm not really safe, but then when I, like, get to, like, pray and stuff, it feels like I'm thirsty and then I finally drink the water. Yeah. So, Mark, what does it mean to feel thirsty for God? Uh, it means like you really want to know God. You want to know new stuff. You want to know everything about Him. You know, okay, what does it mean to be thirsty to God, Carla? To me, being thirsty to God is just like, feel like when you feel a little bit like upset or something and then you just don't know what to do and then finally you get the idea to pray to god and then you just it feels like drinking the water okay well actually uh being thirsty to god it means being thirsty to god's presence in your life asking for god's presence this is being thirsty to god 
It's like you really need water when you're thirsty. You really need water to be there. And being thirsty to God, you really want his presence. And when his presence fills the place, you will feel safe. You will feel at peace. And you, you will have such a, a fulfillment. King David in Psalm 42 described his longing to be in God's presence. Can you guess how did he describe this thirst to God? He described himself being like a deer. Like a deer. That finally drank the water from the river. So basically they were running and they were on a hike. But uh -huh. then they felt thirsty and then they were they really had far to... from the water. Mm -hmm. So they kept on walking and going forward and they finally drank the water. Uh -huh. So as the deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. So... For him, God is not a concept. He's a living God. When can I go and meet with God? How about we sing this psalm? What do you think, Carla? Yeah. Mark, what do you think? Is it a good idea? Yeah, okay. the deer that pants for the water. Right? Okay. Let us sing to God's glory, Father, I adore you.
And now let's take some time to prepare our minds and our hearts to not just hear, but to receive the word that God has prepared for each one of us today. Let's pray together. God of wisdom, by the power of your Holy Spirit, open our minds to your truth, our hearts to your gospel, and our hands so that we can do your will. In the name of Jesus, your loving word, we pray. Amen. Our first reading is taken from Psalm 69, reading a variety of verses, starting at verse 7. Hear the word of the Lord. For I endure scorn for your sake, and shame covers my face. I am a stranger to my brothers, an alien to my own mother's sons. For zeal for your house consumes me, and the insults of those who insult you fall on me. When I weep and fast, I must endure scorn. When I put on sackcloth, people make sport of me. Those who sit at the gate mock me, and I am the song of the drunkards. But I pray to you, O Lord, in the time of your favor, in your great love, O God, answer me with your sure salvation. Rescue me from the mire. Do not let me sink. Deliver me from those who hate me from the deep waters. Do not let the flood waters engulf me, or the depths swallow me up, or the pit close its mouth over me. Answer me, O Lord, out of the goodness of your love. In your great mercy, turn to me. Do not hide your face from your servant. Answer me quickly, for I am in trouble. Come near and rescue me. Redeem me because of my foes. Our second reading is taken from the book of Matthew, chapter 10, reading verses 24 to 39. A student is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the student to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If the head of the house has been called Bezilabab, how much more the members of his household. So do not be afraid of them. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your father. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men will disown him before my Father in heaven. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We finally got around to taking our Christmas lights down last week, which kind of got me all melancholy about Christmas. I mean, I love Christmas. It's one of my favorite times of the year, all the warm and fuzzy feelings and the wonderful sentimental picture that goes with Christmas. The sweet baby Jesus in the manger and all of our songs we sing are about Jesus, tender and mild how he lays down his sweet head and no crying does he make, and all sorts of other wonderful things about this divine child. Isaiah 9, 6 reads this, For to us a child is born, to us the son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And that truly does fit for that time of year. But I wonder if after Christmas, if we have a tendency to leave Jesus as a baby in the manger for the rest of the year. For some, 
he may be in that manger for his entire adult life. There's a story I'd like to share with you that comes out of Chicago. And it's about how the how a baby Jesus figure had been stolen from a nativity scene at the Daily Plaza. Now, the police recovered the baby Jesus at a bus station after an anonymous tip. So after that, they secured baby Jesus into the manger with a cord and a bolt and a padlock to prevent anyone from stealing it again. Well, it didn't work. A couple of years later, a 19-year-old college student was able to slip the baby Jesus underneath the cable, and baby Jesus was on the run for two days. Eventually, baby Jesus was returned to the manger, and the thief was charged with a misdemeanor. So they ramped up the security measures yet again. Now it's a team of people. And they're responsible for making sure that the baby Jesus doesn't get stolen anymore. They're known as the God Squad. And they're very tight-lipped about what security measures they're prepared to take or put in place. It's sort of like protecting the president. Somebody said they hooked up an electrical shock system so anyone who tries to steal baby Jesus, well, they could get to meet him for real. That's what one of them at least said. It was a joke. It was a joke. Well, at least I think it was. But the goal of these folks is to make sure that Jesus never leaves the manger, which is what we do to him when we don't let him grow into a man. It's like when we say to our own children, you'll always be my child to me which quite frankly is no more helpful for that child than it is for Jesus. When we keep Jesus in the manger as an adult, we picture him always as being a mild, sweet-natured, gentle savior, somebody who talks softly, who's got a perfect complexion and a twinkle in his eye, pretty much a big grown-up baby. We certainly, with that picture in mind, would never ever imagine him being combative or in any way socially impolite. We certainly wouldn't expect him to say the kind of things that we heard him saying in our reading in Matthew today. Matthew 10, 34. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword, says Jesus. In fact, the adult Jesus delivers a number of shocks throughout this reading that don't exactly match up with our vision of the adult version of Jesus, baby, meek and mild. First, the shock of adult Jesus's version of peace. Do not think that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I've not come to bring peace, but a sword. Who are you really? And what have you done? with the Prince of Peace. Well, he's still here. But if you're looking for the Prince of Peace that brings about an earthly peace, where everything is peaches and cream, where life could be a dream, where everything is hunky-dory and everybody likes you, well, if you're looking for that kind of peace through the Prince of Peace, you're not gonna find it. The kind of peace that the Prince of Peace brings is reconciliation, and that is specifically between God and humanity, between you and your God. Jesus Christ is the only reason why we can truly live peaceably with God. The right relationship with God is the foundation of living in harmony with all of his creation. The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus takes our guilt and our hostility and disobedience toward God at the time when we were at odds with God, and he took it, took it upon himself and replaced it with all of his righteousness. Paul goes on to say, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, because of the sacrifice that he made on the cross and assuming our sin. 
As a result of that sacrificial act, there's no more hostility, no more guilt, no more condemnation between us and God. Just peace and abundant life in Christ given freely to everyone who believes in Jesus through faith. You accepted the peace the Prince of Peace brings. You become reconciled to God and at peace with God. But as I said, that kind of peace is not the peaches and cream where life could be a dream kind of peace because this peace now means that typically we will be at odds with everyone else who has not yet been reconciled to God. This could be our friends, it could be our co-workers, it could be our government, it could be our family. So this peace comes, as Jesus says, a sword. Not a sword of death or destruction or aggression, but rather of separation and division. Once reconciled to God, we learn to see through God's eyes, to see what God is doing, what God wants to do in an effort to get his creation right side up again. And we realize that God is at work far beyond any one of us as individuals because God wants to reconcile his entire creation. And as Matthew tells us, we don't get to be silent about all of that either, about what we see or hear that God is doing or wants to do. In our reading in 10.27, whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. And what you hear in the ear, preach on the roofs. Silence isn't an option. And not everyone is going to like what we have to say because not everyone is in agreement with God's way. So we can end up making waves and divisions because we're called out to call out injustice and oppression. So we end up disturbing the status quo. That is the sword that Jesus brought and that is the sword that Jesus places now in our hands to wield not to bring violence, not to destroy, but to bring truth and justice to a world that sorely is lacking of it. We're called to shout, not be silent. And when we shout from the housetops, it must be grounded. What we're shouting must be grounded in the truth that comes from God. We have to be sure of what we proclaim. Does it match the God that Jesus presents to us? Is what we're shouting representing the truth that Jesus came to proclaim? Or is the sword we're wielding a sword of our own frustration, our own anger, our own selfish desires, our prejudice? Or is it truly a sword of Christ's truth? Because his truth does not tolerate racial socioeconomic, gender, age, or religious discrimination in any way, nor does it justify or tolerate any ism of any kind. And not everyone's going to see it the way God sees it. Not everyone is reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. So there will be division and disagreement. Now, this isn't new for the church. Right from the beginning, the church was persecuted first by the Jews and then by the Romans, and it continues today. All over the world, Christians face penalties and imprisonment and even death. In an article by the BBC News, it was reported, and I quote, in some regions, the level and nature of persecution of Christians is arguably coming close to meeting the international definition of genocide, according to that adopted by the UN. Now, the severity of persecution may wax and wane in different times and places, and yet somehow we still become surprised when it starts happening right in front of us, when the targets are Christians that we know, or even ourselves. Like when the legislation in our own country is being developed, which is aimed at making the Bible hate literature. 
In a report by the CBC, it says that in Canada, the religious rights for Christians are being eroded. Goes on to say in various municipalities, Christians have been prevented or even fined for holding church services in a rented public space. Three provincial bar associations refuse to accredit any potential law school graduate of Trinity Western, a, a Christian law school. Other professional bodies have indicated that they want to force doctors to violate their consciences by either performing or being forced to refer for procedures that are immoral in accordance with their beliefs, in spite of the fact that the Charter of Rights protects their right to refuse care if that's what their conscience tells them. The Charter of Rights is systematically being used to protect every other religious right except those of Christians. Just two short years ago in Canada, the federal government told Christian organizations that if they wanted grant money to hire summer students, they had to align with the government's values around abortion, regardless of whether that would cause them to betray their consciences and values or not. And in spite of the fact that the beliefs they hold about abortion are completely within the bounds of the law. It was said in the article that their only crime in this instance is that their values didn't align with those of our prime minister. It's ironic that Trudeau insists Canadians support diversity inclusion, says this article, when he himself does not. It seems we're not only living in a post-Christian society, we are living in an anti-Christian society to a large degree. Jesus says, I've come not to bring peace on earth. I've come to bring a sword. That is separation and division. That's because there will be those who do not like God's way, are not reconciled to God through Christ. Jesus says, if they're against me and you are for me, they will be against you. It will lead to persecution. The truth about the Prince of Peace is that he's not a passive savior or a pushover messiah. Somebody who has come just to make us feel comfortable, that's not his sole reason for coming, to make us feel better. There's much, much more to his purpose than that. He's not the babe, meek and mild, laying in the manger. He's God's ambassador. He's God's warrior. Jesus is the most radical person that's ever walked the face of the earth. And the sword that he uses is the one that calls all people back into communion with God, back into the kingdom of God, his Father. The reason why this is threatening, why this disrupts and divides, is because we all have put something else in the place which rightfully belongs to God and to God alone. Just as Herod was threatened by the birth of this rival king, so should each of us, actually, because Jesus comes to dethrone whatever we have on the throne of our lives over which he has sole authority. And Jesus gives us some examples. And here comes the second shock the adult Jesus delivers. The Prince of Peace wielding a, a sword was the first shock. And here's number two. And thank you so much, Jesus, to deliver this on Father's Day. Here is adult Jesus' version of family shock. He says this, For I have come to turn a man against his father, daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Let's be clear and get it off the table so we don't go down that rabbit hole. Jesus is not encouraging us to neglect our family. Jesus is not saying it's wrong to love our children or to be committed or love our parents. Family is not evil. At the same time, he's saying, 
As good and wonderful as family can be, it cannot be exalted to a place where rightfully it should not be, a place that should be reserved for God alone. I don't know. This might be making you feel just a bit uncomfortable. And if you are, it's that sword that Jesus is wielding that seems so contrary to what we value. It can cause division and separation even for those already reconciled to God. Imagine the division, the discomfort that it will create with those who are totally at odds with God and with those who follow God, which would be you and I. The point that Jesus is making is that sometimes our allegiance to our family conflicts with our allegiance to Christ. And it's in that moment that we discover the true nature of our faith. So Jesus now names another thing that we often put in the place that belongs to God alone, and that is ourselves. Verse 38, and anyone who does not take their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Talk about bringing division. I mean, self-denial is not exactly a popular message these days. To die to self, to die to self-achievement, to self-betterment. But that's what Jesus is saying. Anyone who does not take their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Everything that Jesus is saying in scripture today is counterintuitive and certainly countercultural. Give up my life and I'll find it. Yet, at the end of the day, these aren't things that we can negotiate with Jesus about. We can't bargain with him. We can't say, well, okay, how about I give this much up, but I'll keep that. The peace that comes to us by being reconciled to God through accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior is an all or nothing kind of thing. Jesus demands all of us, not part of us, when we come to him. So that means we cannot cling to a brother or a sister or a mother or a father. We must learn how to cling to Jesus first as a priority only. Jesus demands our total allegiance, our total obedience. He demands that we put him above all else. Jesus demands an absolute faith, not just head knowledge or ceremony on a Sunday morning. Jesus wants to cut away the sin that has attached itself to our eternal souls, and to do that, he must use the sword. Sky Janathi Put it this way, at the heart of Christianity is the paradox that Jesus speaks of here. He says that the one who finds their life, who maintains their life, who controls their life, will in fact need to lose their life. We may throw God a bone every now and again, but ultimately Jesus says that's not going to work. It's just the opposite. It's the person who gives up their life, who surrenders themselves completely to God, who keeps none of their dreams or hopes or desires for themselves, but gives it all to God, lays it down before God, who will find real life and life abundant. As I said earlier, Jesus comes to dethrone every illegitimate king over our lives, including ourselves in order that we might receive and press into all that the peace, that the Prince of Peace offers. What does he offer? Well, Jesus offers to set us free from our old lives so we can start a fresh new beginning. He offers forgiveness and deliverance from all self-centered and hurtful and even shameful things that we have done. Jesus sets us free from the sin that we might conjure up on our own and that which Satan might lure us into and anything that would seek to keep us, keep us back in our old ways and keep us away from God. 
As he said in John 8, 34, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. But if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. What else does Jesus offer us? Well, Jesus gives us new life right now. He gives us the life, the power, and the presence of God. Jesus gives us the Spirit so that we can have a brand new life now. He gives us a new identity and a new purpose. We are now followers of Jesus who are gifted and equipped to serve him, to pick up our cross and follow him. And he gives us a new community, the church, his family, becomes our family. He also gives us life in the age to come. Jesus said in John eleven twenty five 25 to 26, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though they die, yet shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. He gives us the gift of eternal life. With him in the kingdom, with he and God forever. Jesus, as the Prince of Peace, gives his all. Now to receive it fully, to live into what he gives, requires our full allegiance and obedience to him, even above regard for our own lives. As Jesus said in Mark 8, 34, if anyone would come after me, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. To take up a cross is to die to self and to live for Christ. You know, we all want the benefits of faith. We want the assurance and the comfort and the joy but we really don't want the other side. We don't want the self-sacrifice and the suffering. We don't want the cross. But it's a balance. The adult Jesus fully gives and he fully demands. And so we're being asked today, do you want to fully receive the gifts from Jesus, the gifts that Jesus offers? The second question is, have you met his demands? For whoever would save their life will lose it, he says. If we refuse Jesus' demands, we will lose our lives in the coming judgment of this world and its evil. But, Jesus says, whoever loses their life for my sake and the gospels will save it. If we lose our lives, that is, give Jesus all that he demands, which is everything, then we will actually be co-authors of saving our lives. We will receive all that Jesus has come to give to us. So the question for each of us now is where do you stand in relation to what Jesus fully gives and what Jesus fully demands? Thanks be to God. Amen. And now our praise team is going to minister to us through music by singing, How Can I Keep From Singing? Let's go, 
Pentecost season celebrates the gifts of the Spirit that are energized in the church to touch the world with, to touch the world with God's love and God's mercy, God's truth and God's justice. Whatever we offer back to God becomes a gift which can change the world for the sake of Jesus Christ. Let's sing together. Now thank we all our God. Let us come together now in prayer as we offer up to God our prayers of thanksgiving, of concern, and intercession. Let us pray together. Wondrous God of the universe who finds time to whisper your love to us, we come to your altar with grateful hearts. When you speak your love into our quiet moments, it is the most precious gift of all. It's not a gift for us to hold and hide, but to proclaim from the housetops. May the gifts we offer to you proclaim your love loudly to a world that often feels forgotten. God of compassion and courage, in our weakness, you are strength. In our darkness, you are light. In our sorrows, you are comfort and peace. Embrace, we ask, each situation we remember in our prayers this day with your steadfast love. We thank you for moments of joy that still break into our lives even in the strange times of pandemic and reopening of our communities. We thank you for love given and received, for friends who furnish our life with meaning and happiness, and for family who embrace us with love and understanding. We thank you for all caring and faithful fathers celebrated this day, remembering those whose fathers have died and praying for those fathers cut off from their families. God of the nations, we pray for our country and countries around this world so deeply affected by COVID-19. Guide leaders to make wise decisions about reopening communities and give patience and courage to those whose lives have been disrupted, especially those who fear what the future holds. Wherever injustice rules and misinformation confuses, protect the vulnerable and shine the light of your truth to reveal the path to justice and renewed hope. God of compassion, we pray for peace to prevail in places torn by war and ask that respect for human life will grow wherever people are abused or scorned. We pray for all those who are suffering and for all who mourn significant loss. Surround them with your love and support them with the strength of your spirit. Open our eyes to see how we might bring comfort to those who are hurting. Eternal God, you hold the dead as well as the living in your tender care. We thank you for your people in every age who have entered into your heavenly presence, especially those dear to our own hearts. Keep us in communion with them and bring us to dwell with them at the last in your everlasting light. God of the universe, hear us as we offer up our prayers in silence for the concerns on our hearts this day. God of peace, awaken us as a community of faith to the truth about which controls us. Draw our attention to the reality of the threat to life that is selfishness. And birth within us anew the enthusiasm of your spirit that we may to enjoy move into the future to which you call us in obedience to your commission and in the authority of your name 
even the precious name of Jesus Christ, for it is in his name that we pray. Amen. Let's sing to God's glory. Come, thou almighty King. now, my friends, go and live as free people in Christ. Walk by the power of the Holy Spirit and the blessing of the triune God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you this day and always. Until we meet again, may God bless you. Amen.